Amen, church. You know, I'd never heard that song, Happy Birthday, Jesus. I thought those kids blew it out. I hope, uh, whether you have a child that was singing up here or not, I hope you'll encourage them uh, during our fellowship uh, at the end of today. In keeping with the season, the title of our lesson today is Worshiping Jesus. There are four points. Number one, worshiping the baby Messiah. Number two, worshiping the all-powerful Son of God. Number three, worshiping the resurrected Savior. And number four, worshiping the glorified Lamb of God. You know, it's been said, the wise men worship Jesus. And wise men still do. Let's turn to Luke at this time. In chapter 2, Luke includes in his gospel how God literally moved the entire world so that the prophecies about Jesus would come true. He moved the heart of Caesar Augustus, the most powerful man who led the Roman Empire at that time, to call for a census. And what that meant on a local level was that Joseph and Mary, whose home was in Nazareth, had to go to the city of Bethlehem, which was where the prophets had prophesied that the Messiah would come from because of the census and Joseph being in the line of David. Jesus is born in the little major there in the town of Bethlehem, and we pick it up in verse 8, chapter 2. And there were shepherds living out of the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. And then we read in verse 20, The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they'd heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Jesus, the Christ. We understand that that title is the same Greek word as the Hebrew word for Messiah, which means the anointed one. And the Bible says right here that literally the night that Jesus was born, Literally, the heavens broke out in angelic song, praising God. The shepherds were taken aback. They were terrified. And then the Lord put upon their heart to go see the baby Jesus that first night. And after they went to go see Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus, the Bible says that they too began to praise and glorify God. We need to understand that as disciples of Jesus Christ, worship centers on Jesus Christ, being the anointed one of God that has brought salvation for all mankind. Turn to Matthew chapter 2. A few days later, this account takes place. Verse 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who's been born King of the Jews? We saw a star in the east and have come to worship him. So the Magi come from the east. Some people think from Persia, some from Arabia. But the fact is, these are Gentile wise men that have been brought by a star to be able to see the king of of the Jews. In verse 3, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. Now, you would think that the Jews of all people would be the most fired up. But Jesus' birth 
was disturbing. Verse 4. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. And of course, we know that Herod was up to no good. The interesting thing that caught my eye right here is the fact that the Magi come to Jerusalem trying to find out where exactly the Messiah was to be born. King Herod calls upon the experts of the law, and they answer from Scripture that he is to be born in Bethlehem. So they literally go to the Scriptures to find the answer to the wise man's questions. And yet, even though they believe in the Scriptures, they do not want a Messiah. Verse 9. After they'd heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they'd seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened the treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, of incense, and of myrrh. And after having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. You know, right here, we find that when the wise men who had traveled so far to see this Messiah, this Christ, this anointed one, when they came into the presence of Jesus and they knew it was because the star had stopped right there. They were overjoyed. Their immediate response was to bow down and then to worship Jesus the Christ. Amen? Now, the Oriental custom at that time was that when you were ushered into the presence of someone you considered of a higher status, you were to give them a gift for that privilege. And the measure of the gift was, in fact, the degree you perceive their status above yours. And so here are these three great Gentile wise men who traveled literally hundreds of miles, who when they are ushered into the presence of the baby Messiah, they're overjoyed, they bow down in awe, and they offer these incredible Gifts of gold, incense or frankincense, and myrrh. Now, of course, the reason a lot of people talk about the three wise men, and we really don't know how many there were, but there were three gifts, and so they kind of presume three wise men. Amen? But each of the gifts were symbolic at that time and for our time. The gold was symbolic of Jesus' kingly office, his royalty. The incense of the frankincense was a fragrance that when it was burned, it was, was beautiful smelling. And so this represented his priestly office and his divinity. And most interesting to me is the myrrh. Myrrh literally means bitterness. And it represents his prophetic office, the fact that he was going to suffer. As a matter of fact, myrrh was used as an embalming fluid for people that died to keep their bodies from putrefaction. And so right here, these wise men, these magi, give these incredible gifts because they truly understood they were in the presence of the king of the Jews, the Messiah, that was called on by the heavenly God to go and to worship. My question is to you this morning, did you come with that same heart to worship Jesus? You know, this past... uh, a couple of weeks has been kind of challenging for Elena and myself. We took off last December 2nd, returned December 9th from Santiago, Chile. And in order to save a little bit of money, because the church there sacrificed their missions contribution to pay for our flight down, uh, it took us basically 30 hours to go from Los Angeles to Chicago to Sao Paulo to finally Santiago, Chile. And then 30 hours back. But you know some It was absolutely worth it. Uh, We we got down there at the airport. It's midnight. Literally, the whole church turns out at the airport. I mean, that just shows the heart of the church, doesn't it? And when you get greeted at the airport at midnight, 
I mean, you, you wake up and go, wow, this is, this, is, this is incredible. But we got there, and the church overall has been doing great. Matt's uh, learning Spanish, and that, that's awesome. But for those that have ever learned a second language, uh, after about three months, you kind of hit the wall. Well, Matt hit the wall. <laughs> and so it was good that we were down there to encourage him. But it is exciting to think that he is preaching in Spanish to the church. And, of course, Helen's fluent. But one of the things that was remarkable was in particular the Sunday worship service. Because we didn't really know what to expect. Matt had to make a very difficult decision the previous week. They had to take out of leadership their number one song leader who, I mean, was a very gifted musician. And basically, he just hadn't been doing well spiritually. And, you know, when you're not doing well spiritually, it transcends on how you come across and how you lead worship. And so they turned to kind of, if you will, their second string guy. Now this was a, a, an, an older guy, uh, probably about 60, 65. He was balding. And uh, honestly, Matt didn't know what to expect. Helen didn't know what to expect. Elaine and I didn't know what to expect. We get in there. And of course, in our former fellowship and in our fellowship in Central and South America, all of the services are instrumentally done. There's no a cappella singing. And so this guy, whose name's Miguel, he gets up there, and he just hits that first note, and you know he is fired up to worship the Lord. His wife's on his far side playing the guitar, and she has an incredible voice. His daughter, who had fallen away as a teenager and has recently been restored in the church, she was up there singing, 18 years old, she was super fired up. And then they had a young convert, just eight months old, a guy named Brian that I think Raul even studied with some. He's playing the, the, the piano, the keyboard up there, typical AMS guy, ponytail, you know, the whole thing, you know. <laughs> and I mean, you, we were led incredibly. The, the, the singing was absolutely phenomenal. You knew that that song leader, the song leaders in general, and the people that day had come to worship Jesus Christ. What was extra special in the service was we had another man named Carlos and his wife, Mary Elena, come forward. And they were presented to the church as the first elder in training. Now, in the history of our former movement, there has never been an elder in training in the Spanish-speaking part of South America. So this was a moment. He's up there. His wife's fired up. And, of course, you know, we believe in our fellowship that there must be at least two in order to be able to have an eldership. But after the service, after seeing Miguel, I mean, I'm going to Matt. I said, Matt, there's your other elder in training. And certainly Carlos is a powerful man. We're hoping he'll go full time here shortly. And he's got two incredible faithful kids. And Miguel, of course, has his faithful daughter. And isn't it exciting to think that in just a few months, the Santiago church is going to have a true eldership in the Lord. And so we learn a lot from this situation. We, if we're going to really worship the Lord, we need to have spiritual men and women who are doing awesome with the Lord in order to point us to Jesus. Are you with me right here? And secondly, we need to understand, just like these magi, when they came before Jesus, even the baby Jesus, they were overjoyed. They bowed down in awe. And they offered the very best that they had to God. That's the heart to worship Jesus. Let's move on. Matthew chapter 14. Amen. We remember in Matthew chapter 14, the feeding of the 5,000. After this miraculous feeding, Jesus sent the apostles away in a boat that night. And now we're going to see... Our second point, worshiping the all-powerful Son of God. We pick up the text in verse 25 of chapter 14 as the apostles are out on the Sea of Galilee in the middle of the night. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. 
Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sing. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Wow. Can you imagine being out on the Sea of Galilee in a storm? I mean, I don't care who you are. That's a scary situation. But then when you see someone walking on the water in the middle of the storm, now that's when you get terrified. Are you with me right here, church? And they literally see Jesus. Now, remember, the water's rough, so you see these waves. and you see Jesus walking on the water. I mean, this is an intense situation. She says, hey, guys, there's nothing to be afraid about. It's me. Take courage. Peter, just filled with the faith of the moment, he says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. Now, he might have regretted that request a little bit later. But Jesus says, come. And say what you will about Peter. But he flat walked on that water. Now, I'm not so sure he just hopped out of the boat. Being human, I would have tossed one leg out first and kind of tested it. You know what I mean? Just just to see if it was hard enough to stand on. No, he still takes faith to to test. He started walking on the water. Now, remember, this is in the midst of a storm. So here are all these waves that are going by. The wind is just whooping around. And yet he's looking right at Jesus, and he's walking on the water. But the moment gets him, the storm gets him, and he begins to be distracted by the waves and the wind. And, of course, what happens? He starts to sink. In the midst of sinking, he cries on out to the Lord, Lord, save me! And the Bible says, immediately Jesus reached out his hand with a little rebuke right there. You have a little faith, why did you doubt? Now, we have to kind of imagine right here that Jesus did yank them back on up on the water and they walked back to the boat. Otherwise, he took them by the collar and kind of had them dog paddle on back to the boat. (laughs) My thinking is that Jesus was nice and lifted them back up and it says immediately when they got back in the boat, the storm ended. Then all the guys just fall down in awe of an all-powerful God. And they worship Jesus. How about it? Is that how you've come to worship this morning? Or are you like Peter, sinking spiritually? Perhaps because of even these financial storms that have come your way. Oh, you of little faith, you can walk on water if you'll but keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and stand in awe that he rules literally the universe and is all-powerful. One of the great lessons that we learn from Peter here is what it means to really have faith in God. If there was one word that sums up Peter right here, it's the word trust. When Jesus said, come, he trusted him. Now, from a human point of view, you do not get out and try to walk on the water, and especially in a storm. But he trusted Jesus that much. That whatever Jesus said, that's what he believed, even if it was seemingly unbelievable, but because Jesus said it. He obeyed it. Amen, church? You know, trust is something that I think our generation has very little of. I think it's because of political leadership, even church leadership. And so we very often pull back our hearts thinking it the wise thing to do, not to trust. When in fact it's really us not wanting to be hurt. The Bible says that love always 
trust. Now, the only man we should worship is Jesus Christ. But the Bible emphatically tells us that we are to trust one another, that this is love. If you take the axiom of that, if you do not trust one another, then you do not really love. I think as most of you know, the love of my life is Elena. And about three days ago, on December 11th, we celebrated our 32nd wedding anniversary. <clears throat> now, I told that to one of the brothers there in Santiago. He goes, oh, man, you were married two years before I was even born. I go, thanks, bro. I appreciate that, that encouragement right there. Thanks, man. Amen. And the inevitable question is, how did you do it? 32 years. In the midst of all the divorces, even in the so-called kingdom of God. I want to tell you something. If there's one word, it's trust. You know, when I, when I got married, I can still remember Elena walking down the aisle that day. And I'll tell you, so I, was, I was the most fired up guy in the history of the world at that moment. <laughs> we had an incredible honeymoon. And then I'd just taken a job in the ministry up in Illinois. As most of you know, Elena was born in Cuba, came over here when she was four years old, and so spent her whole life in a little town of Gainesville, Florida, in the beautiful sunshine state of Florida. I took her up north to Illinois in 1978, just in time to see the blizzard. <laughs> And she was finishing out her occupational therapy studies, and so she had an internship that literally was an hour away in Champaign-Urbana. She'd have to drive the car up there in the snow an hour away and then drive back, which was quite an ordeal. And me, being the insensitive husband that I was, expected cranking dinners every night. And I was slowly getting a bad attitude towards the tuna fish casserole. The beans and hot dogs. And then the spectacular third one that we rotated all the way through, we had three, is tuna fish casserole with peas. <laughs> On top of that, I only had Elena lead three Bible talks. That's no kidding. And I couldn't believe it that three months into it, she wanted to go home to her family. I say that a little bit facetiously. It is to my shame those things happened. But praise God, we, we had some people in our lives. <laughs> that rebuked the living tar out of me. <laughs> but you know, the damage had been done. And there was distance. And there became a lack of trust. And wouldn't you know it? Elena gets shifted for a second half of her internship, very close to home, but in the hospital. And the top administrator in the hospital started hitting on Elena. It culminated on one evening where he said, hey, how about we go out? And Elena says, hold it, I'm married. Look at my ring. He says, don't let that stop you. She knew she was in trouble. She came back, got open. I mean, I set her up to fall. And she knew, and I knew, we almost lost it. What did it take? It took repentance, forgiveness, and mercy. Years later, I fell into internet pornography a couple of times. I'm very ashamed of that. And what, what a disgusting sin. And particularly... In the eyes of women, I mean, Jesus says, hey, you, you look at another woman. You're committing adultery with her. I mean, it, sometimes guys can blow off lust and impurity. Let me tell you something. Let a woman hear about it. It just crushes them. But I'm very thankful. Elena's forgiven. And with mercy, trust has been rebuilt. And I put before you, you cannot have a marriage that's going to last 32 years. You cannot have a happy marriage 
unless there is trust, forgiveness, and a whole lot of mercy. Are you with me right here? You know, one of the things that, that, that I see in building the church here and in other places is that with this generation that is very untrusting and with remnant disciples that are very untrusting, it's really hard to be like-minded to go forward. Now, we need to understand, we do not worship any man or any woman. We worship Jesus Christ. And in him is who we fully put our trust. But the Bible says that we must love one another and that love always trusts. And one of the challenges, I think, in building marriages, but also in building a church, is overcoming your fear and being willing to trust another person again. And let me tell you something. If you put your trust in a person, I'm not talking putting your faith in your person, a salvation in another person, trust in a person, they're not perfect, and they will let you down. But let me tell you something. Only a church where there's a like-mindedness and a trust of one another and a trust that each other is out for God's and their best interest will there be able to produce a church that multiplies disciples ad infinitum and evangelizes that city. You see, there's a lot to be learned right here in worshiping the all-powerful Son of God. I think it also has to be said, if it's the all-powerful Son of God that we worship, then by golly, we need to understand that our church leaders, though imperfect and sinners themselves, are not there by accident. Any more than Caesar Augustus was there by accident, leading the Roman Empire and called for a census. We need to have a sense that God is sovereign. And if someone is wicked, let me tell you something, God will take them out. God always did. But as disciples of Jesus Christ... What we learn from Peter is to be able to trust God so that we can trust one another. Amen? Amen. Let's move on. Matthew chapter 28. Our third point is worshiping the resurrected Savior. In chapter 28, it's the women who first see Jesus risen from the dead. They fall down, they grasp Jesus, and they worship him. And then Jesus says in verse 10 to the women, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Right here, I believe that Jesus wanted the disciples to first be with him in Galilee because he wanted to remind them of the place that they first made the decision to follow him. He had him go up on the mountain, and I suspect going up on the mountain, that always makes you kind of feel a little closer to God. Amen, guys? But perhaps up on the mountain, Jesus pointed out the beach that he called the brothers from to follow him. Or perhaps he pointed out to Matthew the area where the tax booth was, where he called him to follow him. He pointed out the Sea of Galilee, and he made him remember that fateful night that Peter, yes, Peter walked on the water. And they were able to remember all of the great miracles. And the Bible says in response to the resurrected Jesus, the Savior of the world, they fall down and worship. And even some of them doubted at this point. But they still worshiped. And with that sense of worship on their heart, Jesus gives them the charge of which we call the Great Commission. To go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them. See, worship is much more than just gathering in an assembly on a Sunday morning. Worship is our response to God's commands. Turn to Romans chapter 12. In Romans 12, in verse 1. Therefore, as you brothers, in view of God's mercy, 
to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Right here, Paul, of course, is in some ways paralleling the Christian life to the Old Testament sacrifices. And in the Old Testament, in order to be right with God, in order to worship him, you would bring a sacrifice, which would be killed, and then laid upon the altar and burned, and its incense would be prayerfully a pleasing aroma to God. He says, now, under the new covenant, it's different. We don't offer dead animal sacrifices. In order to be pleasing to God, in order to worship God, we ourselves as disciples, in view of God's grace, offer ourselves as living sacrifices for God. Of course, the problem with living sacrifices, they have a tendency to squirm off the altar. He says, in living a life devoted and sacrificial for God, he says, you're no longer going to be conformed to this world, but are going to be transformed to becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. Are you with me here, church? You know, today, we're going to see two women baptized into Christ. Therese and Emma from the Latin ministry. Is that exciting or not? And if you've never seen a baptism, you've got to see it. Because it literally is a miracle of God that you see taking place right before your eyes. Each person that gets baptized like the Bible, they've made the decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of the life. In other words, they are giving everything they have, everything they are, everything they want to be, and giving it over to God and in submission to the will of God. They're making the decision to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And then they're fully immersed in water, sharing in Christ's death so they can die to themselves. And then they're raised to newness of life. I've never seen anybody sad coming out of the waters of baptism. I've seen a lot of people crying. They're so happy. But they know that that moment is a moment like none other. It is miraculous. When they go from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And yet the Bible says that baptism is just the beginning. For some of you young Christians, you know, you say, well, man, I had to do all the studies. I worked so hard. You know, I just really had to just crucify myself. I made it. I'm baptized. No, no, no. That's just when you're born again. Now you got to really start going here. And the challenge that's laid out to us by Paul through the Spirit is that to worship God is to live a life that's no longer conformed to the world, but is transformed to be more and more like Jesus Christ. Well, here we are. It's almost the end of 2008. Does that seem amazing? I mean, I put down the date the other day, 2007. I don't know where the last two years have gone. <laughs> and for some, if I ask the question, has your life been transformed by God this year? You can say, hey, man, I got baptized. I became a disciple of Jesus Christ. Others say, oh, my life has changed so much. But how about you? Are you a different person than when the year started? Has your life been transformed so radically that other people see it? You know, I was with a a good brother yesterday. And we were talking uh, about the church and worship and And in the middle of the conversation, he says, you know something? I'd say one of the guys that's changed the most in this past year, I mean, amazingly so, is Vic Gonzalez Jr. And you know, I thought about it. I said, you know something? He really has changed a lot. 
And the fact of the matter is, this has been one of the roughest years of his spiritual life. Oh, there's the joy of him and Aurora having little Zoe, amen? But sometimes that radical little change in lifestyle right there can do a number on you. You know what I'm talking about here? And the thing is, I've, I've, I've literally seen Victor radically change to becoming a man who is humble before all men, no matter their status, quote, in the world or the church. I see a person now that's asking more questions than telling everybody else what to do. And it's very interesting to me that of all the brothers that, that perhaps could have been mentioned, it was Vic's name that was mentioned. Because the transformation is obvious. How about it? Has your transformation been that radical? Radical transformations are not just for people being baptized. Radical transformations are not just for baby Christians. Radical transformations are what every disciple of Jesus Christ is called to do. And so the challenge comes. Look at your life. And if you've been transformed, then you need to fall on your knees, praise God, and worship him. Because it's God who's transformed you. Amen? But if you haven't, it's flat time to repent. You know, it's kind of interesting. For our, our, our anniversary, after 32 years, you smarten up about anniversaries. You simply go to your wife and say, babe, what would you like to do? <laughs> Don't bother picking out the present. Don't bother picking out a cranking restaurant. Don't, you know, you just say, babe, what would you like to do? And so, on Thursday, I said, babe, what would you like to do? She says, I, I want to see this movie. I said, what movie? Australia. Now, I knew that this movie, in, in the vernacular of our day, was a chick flick, you know? <laughs> but I go, well, babe, that'll be awesome. <laughs> now, I had in mind a cranking restaurant. Candlelight, you know, it's good, awesome food. Because we've been traveling a lot. And, and I, I said, and, and then what do you want to do? I said, well, then maybe we just go to our little Indian spot. Okay, well, that's, that's, that sounds great. But, you know, I went to the movie. That story about Australia. Michelle will appreciate it. Uh, and, 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 and I won't get into the movie itself, but one of the things that came out of it is that the only thing you have in life, this is the Australian Aboriginal mindset, is your story. Not, not any of your wealth, your possessions, or anything you own, but the Aboriginal mindset is that you must make your story. Stories don't happen to you. you got to make your story. And you know, the interesting thing is, I wonder how many of us live that way. Knowing that we are to make a story. You know, we've all read different books or magazine articles, and we've read boring stories. And then we have read the most blow-away stories about people's lives. How's your book reading so far? Or if they made it into a movie, how would the movie go this year? Ugh. That'd be a boring movie. <laughs> you need to understand that as disciples of Jesus Christ, our days need to be exciting. Why are they exciting? Well, number one, we're being transformed. And then we've call, been called as an act of worship to transform other people's lives. We are to go and make disciples of all nations. There can be nothing more exciting than to have the heart to change the world one by one. Are you with me here, church? That's what worshiping Jesus Christ is all about. Let's go to our final point, worshiping the glorified Lamb of God, Revelation chapter 4.
We're going to begin in verse 1 right here. We understand the book of Revelation is written by the Apostle John to the seven churches of Asia. The last church that he addresses the church in Laodicea, which is pictured with a closed door to Jesus. Jesus is standing outside the door of the church because it's lukewarm. And he's pounding on the door, please let me in. Now in contrast to this, we're going to see very quickly that by the Spirit, the door of heaven is going to be opened up to John. And he is going to be ushered into the throne room of God. Let's see what happens. Verse 1. <clears throat> After this I looked, and there before me was the door standing open in heaven. And the voice that I had heard first speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place. After this, at once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelin. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. So here's John. He's going up to be able to see the throne room of God. And the first thing that he sees is the throne. And God is there. Just as someone sitting on it. That's God. See, the, the Hebrew would, would never mention God by name. He says, and the person on the, stone, the throne, well, it was like seeing Carnelin or Jasper. It was sparkling, a sparkling individual. And around the throne of God was this emerald rainbow, of course, reminding people both the Old Testament and the New that God has promised nevermore to destroy his people. Amen, guys? But to bring them salvation. Verse 4. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones. And seated on them were 24 elders that were dressed in white, had crowns of gold on their heads. Wow. Why 24 other thrones around this throne? Well, it's very simple. 12 of the thrones represented physical Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob. The other 12 thrones represented spiritual Israel, the 12 apostles. And here on the throne were the leaders, the elders, in fact, right here. They were dressed in white. They were pure. They had crowns, which means they had triumph, because anybody that is a faithful disciple and goes to heaven receives the crown of righteousness. Amen. And it was gold as a symbol of martyrdom that they had laid down their life to be able to achieve that goal. And so their thrones are surrounding the throne of God. Verse 5, from the throne, God's throne, came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. And, of course, that's kind of emblematic of Mount Sinai, Exodus 19. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Well, seven means perfect. And so the seven spirits really mean the perfect spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. And we also know there were the seven lampstands of the church. He says, hey, the spirit is burning brightly. And you don't want to let the spirit go out in your church. Amen, right here? He says, and beyond all of that, in front of the whole throne was something like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Well, in the palaces in this day, they always had polished marble in front of the throne of the king. Why? Because it reflected all the light to make it even more powerful. Amen? In the center around the throne were four living creatures. And they were covered with eyes in front and back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second like an ox. The third in the face of a man. The fourth like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around. Even under his wing. Day and night. They never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Who was and is and is to come. Wow. So we have the throne of God, the emerald rainbow, but next we have the four living creatures from the book of Ezekiel, and then the 24 thrones. Well, in the vernacular of their day, it was very obvious what God was showing through the Spirit to John. You see, in that day, there were four categories of created things. The lion represented the wild beasts. The ox represented domesticated animals. The man represented 
humans. Amen. Got that one? Amen. And the eagle represented birds. In their minds, that was all of creation. And so what's happening right here is that the center of creation was not man, but was God. And it was God and God alone that was to be worshipped. Are you with me here, church? Here we go, verse 9. Whenever the living creatures gave glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worshiped him, whoever lives forever and ever. They laid their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Amazing right here. We understand for a persecuted church, these words must have been Awesome! That God is above the entire creation. Most likely, the emperor at this time was Domitian. And he sent out word to all of the empire that they were to call him Lord and God. Of course, the, the custom back then was when emperor died, then he became a deity. But Domitian said, hey, I want to be a deity now. And that became the command. And many Christians, because they refused to bow the knee to to Caesar, were killed because of that. But up in heaven, he's saying that the heavenlies were singing to God, you are worthy, our Lord and God. Not Domitian, but God. Are you with me here, church? Chapter 5, verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. Now the scrolls represent the judgments against the enemies of God's people. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside of it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Does that fire you up or not, church? See, right here he's saying, there is no one worthy except the root of David, Jesus. As David had thrown off the Philistines, now the Messiah would throw off the enemies of God's people. And the only person that could unleash judgment on the world, the only person that was worthy was Jesus. Now look what happens. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. Wow. I mean, you would expect this cranking lion figure, wouldn't you? How different God is than our thinking, amen? So the vision John gets right here that's to motivate him is not one of a lion, but a lamb that had been slain. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll in the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Wow, is this cranking? You've got the throne of God, and now the Lamb of God is on the throne, and he's bleeding. You've got the emerald rainbow around him you've got the four living creatures with harps you've got the 24 elders with harps and they're singing praises to jesus this is what's going on up in heaven and the question comes well what's it smell like up there it's cranking (laughs) why the incense of heaven are the prayers of disciples your prayers are aroma, are the very aroma to heaven. Verse 9. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. That sounds like world evangelism to me right there. Amen, church? You have made him to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God and they will reign upon the earth. Wow. Many of the Christians were slaves or from the lower classes in the Roman Empire. And the vision that's given right here is that God 
took their lowly stature on earth and made them a kingdom, made them to be priests, and they are to reign on earth. Why? Because their father is the all-powerful, sovereign God that is worshipped by the heavenly hosts. Do you think this would be encouraging to a persecuted church? It would. It, it encourages me. Now, I'm not terribly persecuted. But what if you were a complacent church? What if you were a sinful church? This might scare the perjeepers out of you. An all-powerful God who's going to take out anything that's hurting his people? Whoa, this vision of heaven. This vision of worship. Let's end it up here. Verse 11. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne, the living creatures, and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that's in them singing, To him who sits on the throne, to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. What a scene. The throne of God. The Lamb of God bleeding, in standing on the throne. The emerald rainbow of promise. The four living creatures singing and praising God. The 24 elders singing and praising God. And then thousands and thousands upon angels singing and praising God. And then all of the saved of all time singing and praising God. Now let me tell you something. That's a cranking worship service. How about it? Is that the heart that you came here to worship Jesus this morning? If you don't like worshiping Jesus down here, then you're not going to like heaven very much. Because heaven is all about worshiping God. Some people go, well, I don't know what's so bad about missing Wednesday night. I don't know what's so bad about missing Sunday morning. Let me tell you something. What would be so bad about missing out on heaven? See, it reveals the heart right there. One of the things that uh, is exciting for Elena and myself to be doing at this time is on Friday nights, when we're in town, we go to the campus of Teen Devo. And I am so proud of uh, the brother and sister leaders there, and Raul and Linda, and Vic and Aurora, and Javier, and uh, Thomas Henry is rising up there in the north. Amen, guys. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, about two months ago, I went to Devo, and kind of the thing was we sang two or three songs, and then we preached. And three songs were always clappers. Amen. And it's good to have clapping songs. But I go, I go, you know something? This is really not a cranking worship service. So I said, okay, guys. Here's what we're going to start doing. We are going to learn to worship God. And so for the past several weeks, we've been singing about 15 to 17 songs. And yeah, we sang three or four clapping songs. And all the young people always love those. But then they're learning to sing the anthem songs, you know. Like we're marching to Zion, standing in awe of God. And then the quieter songs. And it's kind of interesting. One of the, the songs is I said, okay, now, bro, let, let's have them sit down. He said, well, bro, if they sit down, they're not going to be so fired up. I said, bro, how about we just try it my way this time? <laughs> Ironically, the song that we were singing was uh, the blind man sat by the road and he cried. <laughs> The woman sat by the well and she cried. I go, well, amen, the Lord's speaking right there. <laughs> but I think we, we can so much get into a roteness, even about our singing, that, that we lose our sense of worship right here. Yeah, there needs to be an excited joy and a clapping. That's good. But it's a majestic thing to worship God. It's a holy thing to worship God. And we need to stand in awe. When we worship our God. And so the question comes again. How did you come to church this morning? Did you come to worship the creator of the universe? Did you come to worship the savior of the world? Did you come to worship him? 
of whom all of creation will perpetually for all time worship. That's what heaven is all about. And so in the midst of this holiday season, we need to really understand what it's all about. And as the kids sang, the presents are nice, but this is all about Jesus. And for those of us that have been disciples a short time, amen. You are in for an incredible life, and you get to write your own story. And it's exciting. For those of you that have been around about as long as me, the story's not over. I'm hoping for a few more chapters. And you know, when you get near the end of the book, the, the end of the book is supposed to be the most exciting part. But you got to make it exciting. And so church, remember, at the beginning, wise men worship Jesus. And wise men still do. Thank you. God bless.